Bruno Bauer's response to the Jewish question was that the state needs to become secular. The state needs to be emancipated from religion. And then the Jews and Christians and everybody will be truly, fully free, truly and fully emancipated. <clears throat> that was Bruno Bauer. What we're going to look at now is Marx's criticism of Bruno Bauer. To advance this criticism, Marx ends up developing um, the kind of rudiments of a political theory. Um, in advancing this criticism, Marx makes a distinction and then goes on to describe this distinction in considerable detail, or the various things distinguished in considerable detail. Uh, and they have interest in their own right. They're not just all uh, uh, tailored toward a attacking Bruno. It's kind of Marx developing his own thoughts here. And so we're going to want to pay attention to how this works. Um, according to Marx, part of what goes wrong with uh, Bauer's solution, or with what Bauer thinks, is that Bauer fails to distinguish two kinds of emancipation. There are two kinds of freedom or emancipation according to Marx. He calls them political emancipation and human emancipation. And we're going to talk about what both of these are. Now, Marx spends most of On the Jewish Question discussing political emancipation. He has very little to say about human emancipation. We'll talk about what he says about human emancipation, but um, Given how little he says about it, and given how kind of cryptic it is, uh, we're basically just left with question marks there. <clears throat> but we'll talk about it in a second. Let's start with political emancipation. Political emancipation consists in everybody having equal rights and liberties. And so what he's really considering here are states, right? States can be politically emancipated. Groups of people, societies can be politically emancipated. They are politically emancipated when there are equal rights and liberties for all. And what Marx really means by this is that uh, uh, equal rights and liberties for all, what does that mean? That means that rights and their exercise, liberties and their exercise is not tied to things like religion, status, wealth, etc., right? Because if rights in their exercise were tied to religion, well, that's not a politically emancipated state. That's not, you know, uh, a state where everybody has equal rights and liberties. So look at Prussia, for example. Um, you could only, you, you had the right to run for office or to hold office, political office, only if you were a Christian. Jews were denied that right. So that's a right that was denied to Jews on the basis of religion. That's not equal rights and liberties for all. Christians in that case had more rights and more liberties and Jews had fewer. <clears throat> and so Prussia, not a politically emancipated state in Marx's view. Uh, and by and large, most of Europe not politically emancipated. Uh, he indicates that France is going to be the exception here. France appears to be politically emancipated. But his favorite example, his kind of preferred example of a politically emancipated state is the United States. The United States, Marx says, is the kind of paradigmatic case of a politically emancipated state. Now, that might strike us uh, as a little bit bizarre, like, oh, didn't Marx know um, that, you know, women couldn't vote? And didn't Marx know that um, at the time uh, um, that uh, slavery existed, right? The time Marx was writing this, slavery was still, uh, this was prior to the Civil War, the American Civil War. And so how can he say that this is a politically emancipated state? How can he say the United States is? Um, I think those are fair criticisms. Uh, those kinds of categories and discrimination on the basis of those kinds of categories were quite clearly not at the forefront of Marx's thoughts when he's thinking about political emancipation. Um, 
And if you understand him within his context, you can kind of understand why. <clears throat> European countries for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years had discriminated on the basis of things like religion, economic status, how much wealth you had. They'd differentially distributed rights and liberties on the basis of those things. And what had happened just 50 or so odd years prior to Marx's writing this is there was this kind of fervor of, uh, of uh, this kind of enthusiasm for getting rid of all those old qualifications. Right, so what was forefront in the political reality of Marx's time in Europe was the fact that Jews couldn't vote or couldn't vote, couldn't hold office. Um, poorer people couldn't hold certain offices. So most European countries at Marx's time would reserve certain offices for people who met a certain property qualification, who owned a certain amount of property. If you didn't own all that, pro uh, that much property, you weren't allowed to run for that office. Those kinds of restrictions were being rolled back. They were rolled back by the French Revolution. And so that's what was really prominent in Marx's particular historical context, because those restrictions were being rolled back. And that was a huge change. They were rolled back in France and they were rolled back in the United States of America. That was notable. That was amazing, right? That that happened. And so that's what really has kind of captured Marx's attention. It took another century, really, um, before many people started kind of becoming aware of the fact that uh, race, for instance, was a significant barrier that there were uh, to the exercise of rights and liberties, that people were denied certain rights and liberties on the basis of race. It just wasn't kind of in the historical context of Marx's time. <clears throat> And so I think that's why he doesn't focus on that. And I think that's why he's going to take America as a kind of paradigmatic example of a politically emancipated state. Moreover, America and also France, um, even if they didn't in fact grant everybody equal rights and liberties, right? They didn't grant women the right to vote. They didn't grant um, um, African-Americans the right to vote and so on. Even if that's the case, nonetheless, in the founding documents, in the ideals of um, the, the, the founders and so on, you find this emphasis on equality and liberty. And the same thing could be true of the revolution in France. You find this um, incredibly strong emphasis on equality and liberty. That was new. Prussia didn't do that. The old European states didn't do that. And so even if a place like the United States didn't fully live up to those ideals, nonetheless, it was remarkable and noteworthy that those were the ideals that they held out, that that's what they featured in their founding documents and so on, right? Both France and the United States. And so that's what Marx is really taken with, right? And so this stands in stark contrast to Prussia in particular, but to the European states more generally aside from France, <clears throat> right? So then the idea would be, look, you go to a place like America and if you're Jewish, you can still run for office. Um, you can run for office even if you don't own any property, even if you don't have some fancy title in your name, you're not an aristocrat, you don't have any money, you're still totally eligible. You have all the rights that anybody else does. That's Marx's idea, whereas that was emphatically not the case in a place like Prussia. Now, what he wants to say about these politically emancipated states, and again, he's going to be taking uh, the United States as its paradigmatic case, as his paradigmatic case, is that people lead double lives in these politically emancipated states in a place like France or a place like the United States. 
And here, what we're going to start looking at is Marx's criticism of these politically emancipated states. Now, before we really jump into that and what it means to say they live double lives, I want to emphasize that for Marx, political emancipation is a step in the right direction. The United States is better than Prussia, Marx would say. Prussia is worse off, does things more poorly than the United States. Because in the United States, you have equal rights and liberties for all. That's a step in the right direction. You don't have that yet in Prussia, right? That's the whole problem. That's the whole Jewish question is that Jews are denied systematically certain rights and liberties. It's a step in the right direction for a country to eliminate that kind of oppression, that kind of discrimination. And that's what the United States has done. That's what France has done. And so political emancipation, in Marx's view, is an improvement upon... Uh, what was kind of standard in Europe at the time. It's an improvement upon what's going on in Prussia. Now, I emphasize that here at the outset because it's very easy to miss that. The majority of Marx's, dis of, uh, Marx's discussion of, a politi of politically emancipated states is critical. He focuses on the problems that these states run into. And that's right, and that's what we're going to focus on too. But it's important to keep in mind that he also thinks, while they're very problematic in certain ways, they are a step in the right direction. They're better than Prussia. All right, so let's talk about the problems then. So in general, it's like a step in the right direction, but it, you know, another way to think about it, it's not far enough. <clears throat> um, okay, so what are the problems? Why is it not far enough? What are the problems? One way to get at the problems is to focus on this claim that Marx makes that people in politically emancipated states, like France or the United States, lead double lives. They lead a public life on the one hand, which is sharply divided from and distinct from their private life. So the two lives that people le leave, live, lead in these politically emancipated states, a public life and a private life. And they are like almost wholly distinct. There's almost no connection between them, according to Marx. Well, what exactly are these lives? Let's start with the public life, though we'll understand a little bit better what he's saying about the public life when we understand the private life. But let's start with the public life. <clears throat> what does he mean by the public life? Well, this is the life of the citizen, the life we lead, the things we do as a citizen, right? And as a citizen, individuals in politically emancipated states are concerned with, you know, the good of the whole, with the general interest, with justice for all, and peace in the land, and so on, with the common good, you might say. Marx, I think, uses the phrase general interest, or this translation of Marx does. <clears throat> right, so this is uh, the kind of this is what you're doing when you don the hat of the citizen and you go do your civic duties, right? And you're concerned with the good of the of the polity of the right of the state and so on. And you're doing you're being a good, you know, citizen. That's the public life. That's the life of the citizen. Yeah, concerned with the general interest. Okay. Now, what Marx wants to say is that this is actually really good. It's good to be concerned with these kinds of things. It's good to have uh, a concern with the general interest. But the problem here is that our public lives are kind of fleeting. They are insubstantial. They are, to put it in Marx's words, imaginary. The citizen is an imaginary member of an imaginary sovereignty, Marx says. Well, what exactly does that mean? I think what he has in mind is something like this. The idea is that the life of the citizen, political life, is very remote from our individual existences, he would say. Uh, put it this way. The life of the citizen is very remote from our day-to-day -day lives in a politically emancipated state our civic duties, the life of the citizen, the things we do as citizens are not really all that woven into our day-to-day -day worries, concerns, and lives. I think that's what he'd say. 
That's his idea. Now, that might strike you as a bit odd, especially given that we're right in the middle of uh, an election right now, or, you know, the election just happened. But um, uh, given that all this political stuff is in the air. But I think what Marx would say is, well, look, okay, fine. You think about it and you uh, post on Twitter about it or whatever. But um, what do you actually do as a citizen? In your role as a citizen, as a member of this political community, in your role in that community, what do you do? How does that, how does your day-to-day -day life hook up to that? And Marx would want to say, it doesn't really. Every four years, you stand in line for 20 minutes or however, you know, five hours or however long it happens to be that uh, particular election day, right? You, you go and you stand in line and you mark your ballot and then you go home and eat nachos and watch TV or whatever, right? Every four years, or maybe you're super into it. Maybe you're really, and so every two years you go, right? You do the, the um, what do they call it? The, I can't remember, off-term elections. I don't know what they call it. I can't remember what they call it, right? But you show up at the, every two years, right? You're really into it. Well, okay, fine. Even then, so it's what? Half an hour every two years? 15 minutes a year on average? That's what you, and really, even then, that's kind of overstating it. You're just standing in line. I mean, that's not, you know, it's really just like kind of you're voting or something. That's the life of the citizen, right? That's very remote from our day-to-day -day concerns. It's very remote from how we tend, you know, the day-to-day the -day worries that we tend to have and the decisions that we tend to make. It's not really involved with all that. And there certainly are people who are more politically involved and for whom this might not be true. But I think what Marx would say is that people, you know, you might have a friend who's always organizing and is involved with um, political groups and, and so on. And, and even when it's not an election year, they're like doing stuff. Well, I think what Marx would say is that, look, no, I'm not saying there aren't people like that, but people like that are exceptional. Not the, the almost very, very, very few people are like that. Like that's not entirely normal and not in a bad sense. It's just not regular. That's not common. And the very fact that that's not common right? Just kind of proves Marx's point. It's the exception that proves the rule, right? Because it's so exceptional, it proves that the general point that political life is remote from most people's lives is true. Yeah. That's Marx's idea, right? So this is, that's one kind of life we lead and it doesn't really affect, or it affects us a lot, but we don't really don that hat, so to speak, very much. <clears throat> By contrast, the second kind of life that we in politically emancipated states live is life in civil society. It's the private life. Now, civil society here, um, he's picking up on a term from Hegel, that guy that he was influenced by, that philosopher. Um, basically, what civil society is, in Hegel's view, is, um, how to explain it? So you have like the family, on the one hand, that's like this small little community, right? You can think of Aristotle here. And you have the state on the other hand, right? This family is like the smallest community and the state is the largest community. Well, you have all this middle ground here where we go out in public, so to speak, but we're not engaged in the affairs of the public and the affairs of state, right? You go your economic life, your religious life, you're invo involved in sporting clubs and whatever, other kinds of communities you might have, educational communities. All those communities, all those groups and associations and activities would fall between, so to speak, the family and the state. That's civil society. It's that in-between area. You're not quite at the state. You're not, you're outside the family. However, that's the realm of civil society. That's the way Hegel thinks about it. And Marx is just taking that up, right? That's how he's thinking about it. And what comes to dominate, especially for Marx. So uh, he's gonna, he would say something like, that's like your economic and religious life. And for Marx, what this is really gonna boil down to is that's your economic life. This is the sphere of economic activity. 
uh, for reasons that we're not going to get into right now. I'm not sure we're going to get him to do it all this unit, but um, Marx thinks religion is kind of, in some sense, just an epiphenomenon of economics. Whatever, we're not going to worry about it. But really, so it's really economics. Um, that's what life in civil society is is like, is, or is concerned with, right? Are, it's like your economic lives, right? That's life in civil society. Uh, we're going to see this later. He also is going to call this the life of the burger, B-U-R-G-H-E-R. -E it'll be in a later video. Uh, it's where the word bourgeois comes from, which we're going to talk about when we get to the Communist Manifesto. Um, this is just another way of referring to this kind of life. <clears throat> now, when we're living our private lives, this life of the burger, this life in civil society, Marx would want to say what Marx says, and we're going to uh, see him elaborate on this in a later writing. We treat people as means, and we ourselves allow ourselves to be treated as means. What does that mean? Well, life in civil society, your career, your economic life. Um, you allow yourself to be treated as means. No, I don't. Well, yeah, you do. You go and uh, you submit applications to, I don't know where people go work, to uh, uh, Target. I don't know. And, uh, right, and Target hires you, say. And then you go work there and they give you money. They're kind of treating you as a means. They're saying, look, we need someone to sit behind this register and scan things. And, uh, and, and whatever. And so uh, we need you to do that. Will you do that for us? And if you do it, we'll give you money. They're treating you as a means. They need someone to operate the, the cash register, right? And you're gonna do that now. You're being treated as a means. You're a means to getting customers money and getting them out the store or whatever, to run in the store. You're also kind of treating Target as a means. You don't really care about Target. I don't know. Some people like Target too much, uh, but you assume you're not, you're not like that. Um, you're you're, you're uh, treating kind of Target as a means, right? You're you're just saying, well, look, fine. Um, I'm just going to use you, Target, to get some money. I need some money. I want to go whatever, uh, buy some candy. I don't, I don't know what you do with your money. Um, and so I need this job. And so you're using Target as a means. Target's using you as a means, you're using Target as a means, and you're all happy with it, right? Everyone's kind of, well, maybe not everybody, but you know, yeah, that's how it goes. Maybe you want a better job than Target, and so you go apply at uh, whatever, I don't know, McKinsey or something. Okay, fine. But it's the same thing. Same thing. It's everyone's using everybody as a means. And more generally in your economic lives, yeah, you go to... Uh, Starbucks to buy a coffee. You're using the barista as a means, right? They're just a means to you getting your coffee and, and so on, right? That's how our civil lives work. Lives in civil society, our private lives work. And Marx wants to say, this is, this is the way Marx puts it. This is where the real individual appears. This life is not remote from our individual existence. This is what our day-to-day -day concerns are taken up with. This is where we really live our lives, where we show ourselves. This is what kind of really concerns us, right? When we think about our lives and what we're doing today, it's going to be involved with all this economic stuff. When, uh, you, you know, just the kind of day-to-day -day planning, but then the more general planning, you think about your life, you think about a career first and foremost, right? That's like, what am I doing? And, you know, like that kind of, your career kind of takes over your life, becomes your dominant focus in your life, right? That, and so civil society, this is where the real individual appears, according to Marx, right? So people in politically emancipated states live these double lives. There's this public life and this private life. The real individual shows up in the private life and not the public life, according to Marx. Turn now to human emancipation, right? So we have some understanding of political emancipation. Okay, good. Human emancipation, what is that? Here's what Marx says. He says the individual becomes a species being, okay? Going a little bit further, he says something like, humans recognize their powers as social powers. And okay, we're going to return to both of these ideas. But for now, 
What on earth does any of this mean? Who knows? Marx does not elaborate here. Species being? We're going to talk about it later. We're going to see Marx kind of return to this idea. He's never quite as direct and as explicit as you'd like. He kind of throws this word in there and then moves on without really explaining things. But when we read a series of things, which we're going to be doing, that talk about species being, that talk about this idea of social powers, you can kind of start piecing together what Marx's view here is. Uh, but as far as on the Jewish question is concerned, this is all he says about human emancipation. And it's baffling, or it's kind of cryptic. It's really hard to make sense of just on its own. And so we're not going to spend too much, we're really not going to spend any more time than we just have talking about it. One thing I do want to say, two things. First, human emancipation, that's like true, real, full emancipation. Human emancipation is authentic, genuine, real, true, full freedom. That's what we're really striving for, is human emancipation. Yeah. Um, second thing I want to say, humans recognize their powers as social powers. You can already kind of maybe see what he's getting at here. Again, like I said, we're going to return to this. But consider uh, private life there over in political emancipation. Human beings in a politically emancipated state do not recognize their powers as social powers. That's one implication of what Marx is saying here. Rather, they recognize their powers, their abilities, their skills, their talents. They see those things as kind of for me, right? I can use my skills for me for my own self-interest, right? And so I can go uh, to school and get a degree for me so that I can get a job for me, so that I can get money for me, so I can live the kind of life that I want to live, right? In a politically emancipated state, your powers are seen as kind of self-interested. They're for you. Whereas in a humanly emancipated society, uh, people will recognize their powers as social powers. So there's a contrast there, but what exactly that amounts to, we don't know yet. So we're going to leave it there. Now, last thing I want to say about this distinction, I want to bring it back to the criticism of Bruno Bauer. So Marx's criticism of Bauer is that he fails to distinguish these two kinds of emancipation. Bauer seems to think that if you get a politically emancipated state, well, that will suffice for human emancipation, right? Because recall what Bauer thought. Bauer thought that if you got a secular state, which is just to say a politically emancipated state, right? A secular state is going to be a state that doesn't take religion into account when it doles out rights and liberties, right? That's a secular state. That's a politically emancipated state. Bauer thought if you had a secular state, everyone would become an atheist. If you had a politically emancipated state, everyone would become an atheist. And so everyone would be emancipated in this fuller sense. Everyone would experience human emancipation. But Marx wants to say that's obviously false because look, we have politically emancipated states. Look at the United States. It is not, it does not, uh, um, it's not an atheist society. And so it has not experienced human emancipation. Right, Bauer and Marx, as I hope is clear, they're both atheists and they both think religion is detrimental to human happiness and freedom and so on. And so you can't really have true authentic freedom with, uh, when you still have people who are religious. Marx would wanna say the United States is a politically emancipated state, but it's even more religious than Prussia or these other um, European states. <clears throat> if we would have, and so the United States is not human, it's not experiencing human emancipation. Rather, what's happened in the United States is that religion has been taken out of the public life of people and it's been relegated to the private life, but it has flourished in the private life, right? Far from eliminating religion, relegating religion to the private life allows religion to flourish. And that's why the United States is a more religious country than Prussia, say, right? And so Bauer, failing to make this distinction very sharply, this distinction between political and human emancipation, also fails to see that political emancipation is not going to lead necessarily to human emancipation, that you could have political emancipation without human emancipation, right? That's Marx's criticism. 